Welcome to the Breakthrough to Excellence podcast. I'm Jasmine Haley, healthcare provider turned educator, entrepreneur, and startup strategist. Not too long ago, I was burnt out, overwhelmed, depressed, and full of fear from a toxic work environment. I created my business out of necessity to create a legacy I can be proud of today. It helps me transform the lives of women every single day to pursue their dreams and entrepreneurial goals. I created this podcast to share the empowering stories of entrepreneurial women, help you break through self-doubt to your greatness, and share business strategies to help you create a thriving and profitable business. If you are an emerging entrepreneur or business owner that wants to create the mindset needed to escape burnout, reclaim your personal power, and pursue your entrepreneurial dreams, this podcast is for you. Stay tuned and listen in. Hey, welcome to the Breakthrough to Excellence podcast. This is your host, Jasmine Haley. And our guest for this episode, I'm very thankful that she here that she's here. Her, no, her name is Rose Radford. She is a business and wealth mentor and TEDx speaker for ambitious female entrepreneurs. Her aim is to help, and I love this, 100,000 women unlock their income whoop, whoop, and impact potential through entrepreneurship and inner wealth work by the year 2025. Through her private coaching, online programs, and speaking, Rose helps her clients create the mindset and strategy they need to raise their game and unleash their ability to make money and change the world. Welcome, Rose, to the show. Yay, so great to be here. Thank you for having me. I cannot wait to dive in. This has been one of my personal struggles in when I started first started my business. And I think women entrepreneurs are uniquely, um, I don't know, challenged by this. It just seems like every person I've talked to, I have never heard not once, and call me crazy, a guy talking about money mindset issues. So... I can't wait to dive in. But first, I want the listeners to get to know you. One, I'm happy that I've got another international guest. She's in London. So tell me what really sparked your interest in entrepreneurship. What led you on the path that you're on right now? I love that question. So the hilarious thing is that I actually grew up with parents who were entrepreneurs themselves. And I watched them struggle like crazy. And for the first probably 10, 15 years of my life, a lot of the conversations at the dinner table were around, how are we going to pay the mortgage next month? And when you've got that kind of financial stress around you, as a child, you you just don't want to go anywhere near anything that could cause that for yourself in the future. So when I got to like teenager, university type age, I was thinking, no way am I going to become a business owner. I'm going to get a corporate job where it's going to be safe and secure and I'm going to have a salary and then, then I'll just climb to the top of that and I'll be CEO, but like, I'll be paid. And so that's what, that was my decision. That's where I started things. And that then led me to join McKinsey, a strategy consulting company. And I was working really closely with execs in big corporations at the time, helping them solve their most difficult problems. And it was during that time in that job that I realized I'd made an epic mistake. And that actually, I was not meant to be in a corporate job, not meant to be (laughs) salaried. And um, I had so many emotions during that time. One of them was I felt like I was only operating at 60% of who I could be. I was leaving my own potential on the table, my own strengths on the table. And although I was working really hard on very interesting problems, I didn't actually feel like the work I was doing was meaningful. And so I kind of ended up in a space and place of absolute burnout, actually, in the end. Um, I was on medical leave for two months. And it was at that point that I decided I've got to do something different because it's clearly what I'm doing isn't working. And I saw other women making money online in the online space that I hadn't even discovered yet as a corporate person. And I thought, well, if I they can do it, I can do it too. So that was when I realized actually maybe being an entrepreneur uh, would be better suited to me. And the other big thing that really gave me that permission at the end of the day to start that business was realizing that I didn't really value security. I actually really valued freedom. And I was never going to get that freedom by working for somebody else in the way that I define it, at least, because I think we all define freedom in different ways. Um, so, yeah, it was at that point I realized, wow, if I want to be happy in my life, I've got to start a business because freedom is the biggest thing for me. Man, I mean, first of all, you're making my heart sing because it, it feels very validating to know that I'm not alone in my own thinking and to know that there's a lot of common themes 
which is freedom, personal freedom, professional freedom, um, being able to um, to express yourself with your full potential. There are people that thrive in corporate structures and we're thankful for them because we need the world to go. Like not everybody can be an entrepreneur, um, but it, it's, it's really hard when you realize that your, your roundness is not fitting in this peg, right? Like it's not, wait, you know, a square peg, your round thinking, your global thinking is not fitting in that square peg. And it takes a huge amount of courage to do that. Did you have any blockage or fear with taking that step towards that? It's not just money mindset, you know, but for the most part, there are a lot of entrepreneurs that are struggling. I think there's a there's a huge amount of us, and I'm one of them that have had that at that point. And I didn't realize that I was blocking myself, my own self, from really getting to the place that I wanted to be. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really hard to realize, that, oh, actually, it is me that's in my own way here. Um, mm-hmm. And it's a frustrating thing to realize. But just to go to your first question there around um, fear, like holding me back. Oh, hell yeah, like big time. Um, and I played really small as a result of that. I had a lot of fear of judgment because I was obviously leaving this high flying corporate career that I was in this trajectory to go fabulous places and then decided to start this really dodgy looking online business compared to like what my friends <laughs> were like, you're making magic money online it must be dodgy and weird right? like, it must be something terrible that you're doing so, um so that was the first thing I realized I was walking away from this this lovely trajectory in life which actually wasn't going to make me happy but from like an outside perspective, status perspective, it would have been lovely. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then going into something that was seemed very strange. Um, so there's a lot of fear of judgment around that from myself and from from others, frankly. And then when I did get, give myself a chance to get started, I actually only had three months of living costs saved at the time. So I just had to make it work. And um, it was a bit of a scary leap. But thankfully, I'm one of those people that also has a lot of self-trust. And I think self-trust is something that is an incredibly underrated characteristic in a successful entrepreneur. We have to be able to trust our decisions. And sometimes as children, as as teenagers, sometimes we get kind of um, socialized into thinking that our decisions aren't right. Maybe our parents have questioned us on our previous decisions. So that when it comes to making decisions for ourselves within our business, whether that's an investment decision or a niche decision or what the heck it is, it doesn't matter. We have to really trust ourselves. And that trust may have been eroded. So I was thankful that I had that self-trust to get started in the first place and um so yeah three months of living costs saved of course there was a lot of money fear around that but I decided that I just I had to give it a go because there was no other option for me available at that time but felt good for me yeah absolutely as you were talking it made me think about um I'm an educator I have a background in education and I'm in a in a healthcare field and we talk about self-actualization a lot you know, and really get into a place where you feel comfortable that you can maintain whatever it is that you're starting, whether it's a new habit or a new business or whatever the case may be. But I also realized, too, that you have to be humble enough to know that you don't know everything. You won't know everything. And whatever you, it is that you don't know, especially at the beginning, because we already know those coins are tight. Um, you're doing a lot of the work on your own. Eventually, at some point, you would delegate. But one of the things that I appreciate that I didn't get a chance to read off of your bio, and it's on um, the this website right now that I'm looking at, is that you invested over 50,000 pounds in your personal professional development. And I think for entrepreneurs, you have to understand, even when I hit the six-figure mark in my business, I could not get there until I spent the money investing in a coach. And I'm telling you, right before I did it, I felt sick to my stomach because it was such a large amount of of an investment I had ever made besides my education. Can you speak more on that? Because I think too, they they think that it's just like, oh, I'll start the business. And then, you know, I kind of figured out on our own. But many of them, especially you as accomplished as you are, and many um, entrepreneurs out there have invested a ton of time, resources, money to learn what they need to learn to be able to progress. Yeah, I totally agree with this as well. So um, I made the massive mistake of not investing in any support for the first six months of my business. 
how far did I get? Not very far. <laughs> so <laughs> I ended up having to pick up some random work just to pay the bills at that point because it, I just, mm-hmm. it wasn't working. And the thing mm-hmm. is, you don't know what you don't know at that point. And if you want to get results, I'm one of those people that likes to do things quickly and get results quickly. I don't want to hang around in the space of not knowing and not getting the results and wasting time. And so that's what what led me to invest in my first coach. And I knew I needed that guidance and support to get out of stuck mode and to be able to see what I wasn't seeing myself, um, where I was really holding myself back and not realizing it, or even just simple things as simple as like marketing and sales strategies. And I love the fact that you brought up around the amount of money that we spend on our education, because that is huge, particularly in the US. It's a little bit cheaper in the UK, but it's not getting cheaper. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and um, I've spent so much money on education as well, but that didn't teach me how to make money. So and I did a business degree, for goodness sake. So the mm-hmm. fact that I've invested in learning how to make money, learning how to get over myself to um, get the sales strategy sorted, to get the marketing sorted. Um, that's been far more valuable than any of the money that I spent previously. So I think sometimes when we think about investing in ourselves within our businesses, it's too easy to look just at the price tag and not look at the value behind that. And the value really is infinite when you look at yes. the, the ability to make money from that. Yes, absolutely. Oh, it, you actually, I think it was a post that you recently had on your Instagram account that you were talking about that. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. Y'all need to sign up right now. <laughs> <laughs> the copy was amazing. I mean, oh, everything. And already, like when when you, the amount of time that it takes for you to figure out, and I'm still, you know, I know what my strengths are. And, and copy, writing copy is not one of them, Right. To navigate the market marketing and understanding how to speak to the people you want to serve. Oh, my word. It's what a challenge it is. But as you said, the time and the, and the money that you spend to learn those things is like it far exceeds everything that you've learned, especially with your business degree. Oh, my word. I mean, like that should be like the that's the pinnacle of education in many people's minds when it comes to starting a business. Yeah, absolutely. And it was so ironic that actually it really wasn't helping me at all. And I had to get down and dirty with the nitty gritty of business and learn it from somebody who had gone before me and created the success I wanted to as well. Yeah. So let's go back to what your expertise is, which is the money mindset blocks. And um, I don't even know where to start with this, honestly. (laughs) (laughs) I know what those conversations are like, okay? I ha- grew up in a single parent household. I remember when it was like where we didn't have, we didn't know where the money was going to come next to pay for our bare necessities. I remember my mom getting so excited to find like an extra $10 in her pocket, you know? And I have to be really cautious, even myself, when I'm speaking in front of my children. I've start repeating those same things that I was hearing all the time from my mother, and even setting my own price and knowing like what my worth is was really hard for me to even get there, even for my clients, because I'll do it for free real quick. Yeah. Yeah. That's so crazy. And then be well. starving. Yeah. And then starving. <laughs> yeah. I often use the analogy of having a widget. If you were selling widgets in your business, and goodness knows what a widget is, but it's a great word. Um, if you're selling widgets in your business, you would not be selling that for free. You you just wouldn't do it. Yet you will sell your time for free. So many of us will, at least, particularly at the very beginning. And yet time is a non-renewable resource. You can't get more of that back. Yet you can go and make more widgets if you wanted to. So yeah, we, we end up with a very funky belief systems around money, typically from our childhood. And I love the fact that you brought that up, your childhood impacting you, because it's so true. It's so true for everybody. Even if you did have a very abundant childhood, that doesn't necessarily mean you've been set up for success with money in your business. And as entrepreneurs, we simply take our relationship with money into our business. You can't separate it. We we just take it with us. And I actually had one of my mentors, um, unless you've done the work on your relationship with money as a business owner, you're leaving thousands, if not millions on the table 
over your lifetime in terms of revenue and income, right? So if that's, that's powerful. What, I know, if that's not motivation enough to actually look at this seriously, then I don't know what is. And the ironic thing is for pretty much the first, let's say, year of my business, I completely avoided anything money mindset related because to me, that sounded a bit mushy and a bit woo-woo and a bit, I don't know, just not tangible enough. And I'm one of those people that's very tangible. I'm a strategist at heart. My other zone of genius is business strategy is what I did at uni and what I did at McKinsey. So there was no way I was going to go anywhere near this money mindset stuff. But lo and behold, I had all the strategy in the world in my first year of business and no money to show for it. So I knew there was something wrong inside my head. And if anybody who's listening to this isn't familiar with money mindset and what that really means, it's just simply your belief systems and your thoughts and your emotions around money. And then they manifest into your current financial reality. So if you're looking at your business bank account and you can simply know that the money you have right now in your business is simply a manifestation of what's going on inside your head. And if you don't like what you see, then it's time to look at what's going on inside your head, which is great because then that's Mm. in in your control. (laughs) Yes. Oh my gosh. When you really think about it, because I was, I had a conversation um, with another guest and she was explaining that even our money mindset issues affect how we even communicate with our customer, our client. Mm, I, I find that it's the service-based entrepreneurs that are really, really struggling. I feel like more than the product base, as you mentioned, if you were selling a widget, mm-hmm. um, it's hard to kind of wrap around. And I remember once when I had, um, I was complaining to my coach about the fact that I was speaking a lot for free. Mm. I mean, a little too much, right? And was not, I would feel the the anxiety rise up here if I wanted to say the price that I really wanted to charge right so when I go out and speak I not only have to have my husband stay in right or hire a nanny to drop my kids off to school which that affects his income Mm -hmm. and then I have to travel and all of the costs that it takes for me to get there it wasn't making sense what I was charging yeah. And I said, I, I really am struggling with this. I just can't. I, I keep failing at these conversations, at these negotiations. And she said, well, you not setting the price for what you're worth is a is a deep reflection of who you are. Mm. And in, in that sense of how you feel about who you are mm. is how how much you value yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nikita Thinkpin. I love her. That really, really helped. That really helped me tremendously. And also knowing that I am a people pleaser was setting up systems where they could actually request and tell me their budget first before the conversation. Mm, Brilliant. Sometimes you undersell yourself that way. Yeah. Yeah. So I I find that I mean everything that you talk about is is very very important and it's definitely some of what we need to all hear. So what would you say are some of the steps that you think someone should take if they realize that that blockage is happening for them? One, of course, is invest in your program. Okay. But what are some of the steps they can take to even get to that place to want to invest to really help in those mindset money blocks? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's lots of things that go into this. Um, To keep things really simple, I think the first thing, as you said, is that awareness. I think, particularly for me at the very beginning, I had no idea that this was impacting me. So if you're listening to this right now, brilliant. You've actually started to get some level of awareness. Um, And then once you've got that awareness, the second thing is to actually ask yourself, like, what what's driving me to do this? What do I, what must I believe to be true for me to be um, pricing in the way that I am or for me to be feeling so weird about asking for this money? Um, I remember sending an invoice for, I think it was like 26,000 pounds a couple of years ago. And as I sent that invoice, I got this really weird bodily reaction similar to you, right? With the poor pricing thing. Um, And so I just sat there and got curious. And I think that's the best thing you can do with yourself because there's no point beating yourself up about this sort of stuff. It's really a case of uh, being gentle and understanding like, oh, this thing's happening for me. It's making me feel weird. Let's 
see why that is and see if we can make myself feel better around this and start looking at what are some of the, some of the limiting beliefs that are holding you stuck right now and how can you choose to see things differently so a, an exercise I love to do with my clients my community is to ask them what's your goal right now financially so let's say you've got a, a monthly income goal and I would always get them to write it down and then I would ask them questions like why would you begrudge having that money right now and why would you not want that money what's difficult about that what's hard to create that money um, and any kind of questions that dig into why you wouldn't want the money. And that's when we decide, we, that's why we, um, that's how we begin to understand what the barriers are between where we are now and what that income goal really means for us. And I had a client who said, well, if I hit that income goal, my husband's going to ask if he can go on that ski trip with his friends. And I don't want him to go ski while I look after the kids. I thought that is <laughs> so funny. <laughs> But this is why we did self sabotage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, oh um, my goodness. Another thing that often comes up for people is say, "Well, I don't even know what I do with that money. I would feel like, too much responsibility. I just, I don't know how." Or if you gave me that money, if I got it right now, I'd feel like I'd have to work really hard for it to to feel like I've earned it. And I don't want to work really hard. I actually quite like my life right now. So that's when you begin to realize, oh my goodness, these are all these weird and wonderful paradigms I'm living my life through and they're holding me back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh my goodness. And 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 that's why, I mean, the statistics show that many business owners, they don't last the first mm. five years. I believe it's five years. Yeah. And a lot of them fail. And that's why I think a lot of my foundation deals with just mindset in general. Yeah. I mean, money is one aspect of it. But mm -hmm. really, there's a whole nother thousand layers of, of mindset that we have to kind of work through. Yeah. And as an entrepreneur, when you are in those daily tasks that you have to do, and, and of course, as you know, that task, that list never ends. Mm -hmm. um, it's so easy to get burnt out. Yeah. And once you get burnt out, that's it. Like your creativity is at a loss. You don't know how to innovate anymore. And it's very easy to give up, mm. especially. Definitely. Especially I think one of the big starting. things that hold people back that I come across is actually not knowing what your income generating activities really are. And that means that you'll end up burnt out doing the stuff that doesn't really matter at that point, whether that is playing around with your website again or um, just playing around in Canva, canva.com. Oh my goodness. I think I've lost days of my time in there <laughs> previously. <laughs> like that's not good either. Um, and then once you have clarity on those income generating activities, you then are less likely to, to burn out as much because you kind of know where to focus your energy a bit more every day. And I feel like a lot of people also struggle on that piece too. Yeah. Do you find that once someone gets to the place of, okay, I am going to have this four figure invoice or I'm going to finally give that five figure invoice, right? That if someone declines, that it winds up taking them further back because they finally had the guts to ask. Uh, so that and all, that person yeah. didn't. I love this. So it all depends on how you respond to that situation and how much work you've done with yourself before you get to that stage. Um, because really you want to be in a space and place of knowing that it is worth that five figure or four figure a sum and not worry about what people think about it and know that one thing I love to tell my clients, my community is there are clients at every single price point, no matter how high you go, there's always going to be a client that is available for you at that price point. So if you do get a no or that price point that you want to charge, they're simply not your client and that's fine. Um, there'll be a better one. They've that was simply created space for that right client to come in. Um, and so really, it's about coming from a place, a belief system that's really supportive and not and not kind of allowing that no to mean anything about your self-worth um, or anything about you in particular. And there's, I always challenge my clients to separate out what they are versus what their offer is, which is always a challenge with service-based businesses, as you've said, um, because really you are typically selling like your time and your expertise, but trying to package that up into an offer that really is results driven, then you're simply selling the offer and you're pricing the value of the offer rather than the value of yourself. And that's just another way of just framing the, the price point away from your self-worth one step so that it doesn't impact you as much when they say no. Yes, absolutely. I want to go back to like how you had mentioned that within six months of your business, you had to take in some like 
partial, mm. um, you know, work on the part time, yeah. right, to kind of supplement. And I wish I did that sooner. Mm. Because I feel that when you are in a situation where you know your value, you know what you want to ask for, but yet you have the stress of, I need to make this amount of money in order to continue on. And instead of just saying, hey, I need to get rid of these non-income generator um, uh, tasks that I'm doing, Mm -hmm. or I need to know that the person saying no um, I'm not going to be desperate enough to say, well, just, okay, I'll give it to you at whatever price, mm. but actually stick with the plan. It's, I think entrepreneurs need to hear that it's okay, f- that it's not going to all be perfect. The purpose is, is that you stay aligned with what your, your passion is, what your purpose is. Mm-hmm. You stick with what you've created, especially with the value, but also know that sometimes, especially in the beginning, mm-hmm. you may have to um, reevaluate things, pivot. Yeah. Take a part-time job to get in some income, but don't stay stuck there. Yeah. And don't take on clients that aren't your people mm-hmm. because you wind up being more drained, more frustrated and ready to say, peace out. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> everyone. You your business before you even started it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I agree with you. You do, if you can, want to be able to create that basic level income from elsewhere just so you know you're going to get your bills paid and there's less of that um fear around money um i think it's tony robbins that says that if you're in a space and place of big financial scarcity it actually shuts down your decision making capability within your brain which is not a good place to be building a business from um yeah yeah, i totally agree and also when because then i also then end up speaking to a lot of people that have these horrible part-time jobs that they can't stand and they end up blaming it for then stopping them being able to build their business because their energy is drained and their their mindset and their emotions are all over the place because of this other job. And I always encourage them to reframe that because really that job is supporting them. It's almost like they're sponsoring them or investing in their business that they are growing um, by being there and by serving them in that way. And I've, as I said, I've taken part-time stuff just to keep going and to give myself that time and space to make the success that I wanted to create in the actual business. Um, But you've got to then manage it within your mindset about how you think about it and not let it pull you down or drain you at the same time. Yes, absolutely. All right. So the next thing I want to dive in with Rose is pricing ourselves. We kind of talked about how linking that with our, with um, our self-worth, it can be linked with our self-worth. But it's hard to kind of come up with the price. Mm. You know, one of the things that I try to work on with myself and tell my clients to is it's okay to be inspired by others, but you know what kind of value you're bringing, right? And yes, I do believe because I'm one of those people, I will sit and research forever. I've got to do my market research. I'll do a focus group with my ICA. I'm doing all this extra stuff just to make sure. Because in the past, I used to go, boom, I would hit it. I would just make a decision, go, and it'll be all over the place. So now I pump the brakes a lot. But when coming with pr- coming up with prices, they don't even know where to start. Mm. And they don't want to seem, especially with the, the, how the world is changing right now, they don't want to seem like they lack integrity with their pricing. So what advice would you give for someone? They're like, okay, I hear you, Rose. I need to work on this. But like, how do I even start with the prices? Like, okay. where do I even go? Love it. Right. There's so much I could say here, but I'm going to try and be concise for you. So um, (laughs) first thing I definitely want to say is that you can never really price based on your value or your self-worth because you are infinitely valuable. You would never be able to have, (laughs) you would never be able to to work, Rose. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) You would never be able to have like a sum of money big enough to really be able to price yourself. Like it's just impossible. So kind of remove your self-worth from the price point as much as you can knowing that you are infinitely valuable first is probably where I'd say it to start second thing is market prices there's no such thing so when you're researching or what is everybody else charging what you're basically doing then is basing your price point on other people's money blocks and what they think is possible and they've likely gone and done the same thing to other people so you're all just kind of sitting in the middle and potentially not talking to your ICAs. And I love the fact that you did actually speak to them, but even they won't know or be able to tell you what they're actually willing to pay Um, because they're probably going to lowball you far more than what they're actually realistically would pay when they saw the value of what you're offering. Um, 
so yeah, market pricing, market research, it can be valuable as almost like a, a third step in the process or a lot later on just to double check or to kind of compare what your services are like compared to others. Um, but also then asking your ICA, less helpful. What I often suggest you do is focus on two things. So number one, the value of what you're providing. Now, this is a little bit of a, a funny thing to say, because actually, as humans, we will look at a price point and then value that thing based on the price point. So if it's really like a high priced car, we'll value the car loads. And I was actually just on a call with um, a client who's an artist and she's struggling to price her art. I said, well, you put the price point on it and that person will then value it at a hundred pounds or a thousand pounds, but you get to make that decision. So, um, Pricing, by, pricing based on value is actually quite dependent on how you see the value and therefore how they see value as well, which totally proves my point over the fact that there are clients at every price point. Um, and then the second thing I'd say is your pricing also needs to depend a bit on how you feel about things, so kind of a almost like an energetic price. Um, and inside the pricing cheat sheet, which I have given you a link to, so everybody can go and download that, which is brilliant. People love this pricing cheat sheet. And I walk you through a couple of steps to help you determine your price. And one of the things I, cha- I, uh, I share in there are my three P's to pricing. Now, we have P number one, which is your poverty price. And we can all guess how much that is. <laughs> I love what it's called. Yeah, poverty price. There we go. And I won't go into too much detail that on that. That puts everything into perspective, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and whenever I share this in like a workshop or with my clients, they're like, oh no, I'm charging my poverty price. Well, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then you've yeah. got your power price. So that's like, oh, that feels good. Um, the people I'm attracting at that price, they kind of match my energy to this feels great. I want to get out of bed in the morning for that one. Excellent. Um, so it just feels aligned. And then you've got something that I call the piss take price, which sounds funnier when you've got British English, but when you're working with American English, it sounds a bit bizarre. So I'm going to explain that one. It does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a piss take is basically where like you, you've gone to such the extreme that you feel like you're having a joke. It's like, this cannot be real. This is stupid. This is crazy. This is silly. And I'm kind of like pulling their leg. I'm being that that silly about it. So obviously, right, it's much better in British English, but <laughs> the piss take- I'm following you. I'm following yeah. you. <laughs> right. It's so high. You can't even imagine charging that amount of money. That's crazy. And what I get people to do is basically figure out in monetary terms, what are these three P's for themselves? And I always say, I want you to look at that piss take price and realize that that's where you're headed, girl. Because if you really want to grow your income, if you really want to grow within your industry, within yourself, within your business, you're going to be naturally increasing your prices as you go along because you're going to grow out of that power price. And I used to charge £60 an hour for my coaching and now it's hundreds. And I would have looked at that £60 an hour version of me would have looked at my price point now and thought, no frigging way. So that would have been my piss take price. <laughs> but that's allowed me to grow in just a couple of years. And it's the same for everybody else too. So figure out those three Ps and know that you're headed for that, that piss take price because that's the, the next level version of you. And I'll give you just one really specific example on that on how to shift your energy around that really quickly. So I was talking to a friend not too long ago and she was doing workshops for corporates and I think she was charging about £800 and she'd been told by another friend that she should have been charging at least £1,500 but for her it was like no way I can't charge that that's almost double like I just, just can't and her brain went off on one with like how it was just completely impossible and I said to her well what can you charge that feels comfortable it's more than 800 right now and she said well I think I'd be right with a thousand okay cool Do a thousand for your next workshop, but here's a challenge for you. I want you to show up as if they've paid you 1,500. I just want you to imagine that. Show up with the version of you that's been paid that sum of money and see how that shifts things for you. (laughs) She she didn't charge less than 1,500 ever again because it was enough for her to simply embody that and show up in that way and imagine it. And once you've, your brain's imagined it, it can't go back. It's, oh, that makes sense now, I can do that. And even if it takes a couple of times for you to get there, just stepping up into that with your imagination is a great place to start. Yes, I freaking love it. 
I mean, from going, I know what that feels like. And then when you realize that you've been serving at that level, mm. um, I mean, it's when you've been serving at that, let's just say $4,000 level, yeah. speaking, you know, a, a workshop level, and you've been serving that way, but only getting paid 500 How big of a hit is that mm. on on your emotions and your regrets? Yeah. So don't stay there too long. No. And listeners, Rose has been generous enough to share this free cheat sheet to every single person. So you need to go to my show notes and you need to sign up to get this free cheat sheet to change your life. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Excellent. So you can get those piss take, piss take, piss take price. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> piss take prices. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is wonderful. Oh, I am so appreciative. I mean, you really changed even some of my thinking about, um, how to view money mindset. I have one more question for you. This is the last question. Mm -hmm. So if we were to go back to the very first week, the very first year of Rose's first year of being an entrepreneur, what word of advice would you tell Rose? Stop crying. Um... (laughs) (laughs) That's a good one. (laughs) one, Yeah. (laughs) Um, no, there was obviously a lot of fear involved, but um, which brought the tears. But I think one of the things I really held myself back w- with was not making a decision. So a decision on like my niche or a decision on what I'm going to target next in terms of a goal. And you end up with something called decision debt, where you don't actually get any further because you've just ended up with all of these unmade decisions. So I probably would have said to her, make a decision, build that self-belief within yourself and go for it. And don't second guess yourself as much because it's so easy to just second guess and self doubt your way back to the starting point again. And that's definitely what I struggled with a lot in my first year. Oh, it's been so great talking with you. Um, I'm very thankful for your time. Uh, please let the listeners know how they can contact you, where they can find you. Of course. So my website is roseradford.com. And you can also find my free Facebook group, which is called The Rising Female Entrepreneurs. Um, of course it is. And I also <laughs> love to hang out on Instagram. And that handle is I am Rose Radford. So that's all one word, um, nothing funky in between. And you'll be able to find me there. Awesome. Well, thank you again. I appreciate you. It's been great joining you. And thank you so much for having me. Thanks for tuning into the show. Dive in deeper by visiting the show notes for this episode or listening to more episodes on jasminehaley.com. If you found value in the show, share with a friend or leave us a review. I'll see you next time.